Well, good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, my name is Dr. Stormy Monks, and I want to welcome you to today's Grand Rounds presentation hosted by the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health. The Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health is one of 10 uh, pediatric environmental health specialty units, also known as PESUs in the United States. Um, the purpose of the PESU program is to serve as a leading national source of medical information and consultative advice on environmental conditions that affect um, human health through reproduction and pediatric development. So to serve part of our mission, we offer a, this Grand Round series, uh, typically occurring once a month on the third Thursday of each month. And we're so grateful that we have a doc, um, sorry, Mr. George Browski today speaking uh, to us about radon. Uh, before we go ahead and move forward, I just wanna let you all know um, that you are going to be muted during the presentation and you're not able to share your video. Uh, however, if you do have questions or if you have comments, please feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, myself and Dr. Crawford are, are looking for those. Um, and we can share those with um, at the end of the presentation. I want to uh, thank our partners at the EPA and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ATSDR, uh, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics. Without these organizations, the work of the PACU would not exist. I wanna let you all know that this um, presentation is both uh, able to offer CME and CNE credit hours. We ask that you remain logged in through the entirety of the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions at the end regarding your, um, your certificates or anything like that, I'll put an email in the chat that you can contact. Uh, if you are receiving CME or, or wanting to receive CME, go ahead and uh, take a picture of this QR code here, and remember that the activity code is 3574. Our next uh, Grand Rounds will be held February 5th, 15th, uh, at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, doc, um, sorry, Ms. Wanda Helkison will be speaking to us about pediatric uh, injury prevention. You can go ahead and register for that by uh, using the QR code here. I want to bring your attention to two other activities that the PESU is uh, involved with and partnering with. We are having the 11th Annual Pills and Thrills That Kill Toxicology and Review Conference. This is going to be on April 3rd and 4th. Uh, this is uh, both a virtual uh, conference as well as on site. And um, I can get you all more information in the chat for how, um, what to look out for on this one. We also have a Children's Environmental Health Symposium that's occurring April 11th and 12th in New Orleans. Um, you can register for that, that's free registration. We're using the QR code here or uh, the link and we'll also put that into the chat. Uh, just so you know, also coming up May 8th and 9th, we're going to have a Children's Environmental Health Symposium in Houston, Texas as well. So without further ado, the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health uh, would like to welcome George Borowski. Uh, he has been with uh, in federal service for 30 years. For 25 years, George has been the senior regional health uh, physicist and the radon policy advisor for EPA region six. Uh, as an indoor air coordinator as well, George handles calls and emails providing assistance to the, our public regarding indoor air concerns. Uh, he also provides assistance to, assistance to school districts, uh, sharing information pertinent to tools for schools program. Uh, George has been married for 40 years. He and his wife, Veronica, have a son, a daughter-in-law, a grandson, as well as a daughter. 
So again, we are so fortunate to have him with us today. And on behalf of the Southwest Center for Pediatric Environmental Health, we would like to offer him a warm welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Monks, for having me on board here. And good morning and good afternoon to everybody who's online. Um, this is a first for me. I've attended a lot of these lectures here in the past. And, you know, here I am today making the presentation. So, um, again, thanks, you know, to Dr. Monks. And also, let me give a shout out to Dr. Crawford, um, who basically guided me through all this here and making sure that I know what I was doing and hopefully I don't do anything stupid. So bottom line is that I'm going to give an introduction here to Radon and go through a bunch of slides right now. I'm not going to be able to kind of see questions, uh, but the good doctors will, you know, will interrupt me and, you know, point out a question or two. And I'll also have time at the very end to uh, take questions here. So. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and, um, uh, you know, share my screen. Um, and right now you should be seeing um, my first introduction slide, which is uh, introduction to radon. Um, am I looking okay? It all looks good. Please go ahead. Cool beans. Um, the most important thing I will want to say as far as, the, well, the whole slide program is important here, but this is, uh, you know, you got my name and you got my email address. And yes, it's last name, dot first name. And uh, obviously you got to spell it correctly. If not, I'm not going to see it then. If you need any additional information with regarding to radon or on anything that has to deal with indoor air quality, please shoot me an email. Uh, for the last few years, besides handling radon and radiation, I am also doing a lot of indoor air quality work. And give everyone like a heads up here. In 2023, I got 12 inquiries almost once a month on secondhand smoke. I used to work for a county health department in upstate New York um, on the western side of the Hudson River, Rockland County. And we had an indoor air program and I got to learn a lot about, you know, secondhand smoke for an example. And we did a lot of inquiries through that. And I'm totally amazed to be honest with everyone here about the number of calls, the number of emails I've received in last year alone on secondhand smoke here. So, so moving right along and, um, you're seeing my second. You're seeing my second slide. Am I correct? Are folks, yes, seeing sir. Me? yes, you are. Okay, alrighty. So what I have up here right now is basically what is radon, and way up on top you see in the periodic table of the elements here where radon sits itself. Most importantly. Radon is an invisible, odorless, tasteless, colorless, inert, radioactive gas. It comes from the breakdown of the natural breakdown from uranium-238. It goes through the soil, can enter any building, and I don't care where you live, but, you know, you can have an elevated level. The only way you're going to know whether or not you have elevated levels of radon in your home is that you need to test. You are going to hear me throughout this presentation telling you one four letter word, and that's going to be test. Okay. What you see in this kind of diagram is basically how, you know, how radon comes into the house here. Now, a lot of people will come and say to me, Hey, I don't have a radon problem. I don't have a basement. Wrong answer. Doesn't matter if you have a basement or not, radon can creep in into your, you know, into your slab foundation and you know make its way through cracks and crevices obviously people on the on the east in the midwest you know we've got basements galore so that's going to be your first place of coming into here but basically what it is is that from u238 uranium 238 you break that into radium 226 and finally into radon you know 222 Radon-222 has a half-life of what we call 3.8, we say, four days. That means in like in four days' time, 
whatever amount of radon you've collected in your home has now, you know, you know, has gone down to half of that number here. The main concern about radon itself and coming into the home is that it is an alpha particle. You have alpha, beta, and gamma particles. Well, you have an alpha particle. Alpha particles only travel a very short distance in air, like about eh, one inch and such, but it gives off a tremendous amount of energy here. And because it only travels like one inch, these, you know, these alpha particles are going to collect onto dust of which we inhale into that dust here. And so the main cause and concern with regarding to radon is having lung cancer here. Uh, this is coming uh, from the uh, National Council of Radiation Protection, their report number 160 here. This is kind of showing you where, you know, what the breakdown of radiation is coming in, you know, coming into people here. And 37% is from radon and thoron, uh, basically the background um, products of uh, from radon. And so um, radon is by far the greatest single source of radiation to the general public. Ten years ago, when there was an incident um, next door to you guys in Carlsbad at the waste isolation pilot plant, and the plant itself is located 25 miles northeast of downtown Carlsbad. And at the time, I had met with the Secretary of Energy from New Mexico Environmental Department and basically said, your message to the public here is that while this is a concern, you should really test your home for radon because that's going to be the most number one concern you're going to have. Now, how this all happened here? Well, you're seeing a picture of a man and his family. That man is named Stanley Waltrus. Many years ago, he worked um, as, a as a nuclear engineer for the Limerick Nuclear Power Plant, which is like outside of Philly. And one day he was going into work and he had to go through a radiation detector, basically a whole body. And that sounded off. And so people kind of looked and said, okay, something's wrong over here. They put him to a machine, sounded off. And this is like, okay, two in a row, not good. So they took a handheld radiation detector and run it over his hands and his body. And they were getting large hits. And so this is again, what's going on here. Folks from the plant got in contact with the State Department of Environmental Health. They went and did an investigation on his house and basically determined that, you know, he was getting readings within his home here that was like roughly around 4,400 picocuries per liter of radon, basically a thousand times over, you know, considered to be safe amount. And it was the equivalent of having him and his family, and you see the picture of his uh, three little kids along with the wife here, 135 packs of cigarettes a day, you know? And so this is basically, you know, not really cool. And it's because of Stanley Watrous on how a lot of communities and along with the Environmental Protection Agency got on the bandwagon here to start testing and exploring and researching, doing things on radon testing and radon mitigation. Now, I mentioned before that I worked for a county health department in upstate New York, and I joined them in like 1985. The county had a radon program and were providing radon detectors prior to um, the EPA coming onto the bandwagon here. We had like three month detectors, what are known as alpha track detectors, provided to homeowners who requested it. The state health department in Albany, New York, had a very strong radon program that through a bunch of grant programs with a couple of utilities was able to make programs available, excuse me, make detectors available, you know, at free of charge here. So we got a lot of good information from all that coming about here. I did a Google search, you know, and finding out where is Stanley Walters. He's still alive and well. Uh, he left the power plant and was doing some other uh, work then. Radon is serious. It's the second leading cause of lung cancer after tobacco smoke. The number today is 21,000 lung cancers, death per year. 
Epidemiological data has been confirmed by the National Academy of Science, World Health Organization, the International Con uh, Council of Radiation Protection, and along with the combined effects of radiation and smoking, this is going to be even worse. I mean, we've told people through a number of years that you are receiving high levels of radon concentration in your home and are a smoker, number one, you know, mitigate your radon, stop smoking. So the American Lung Association, the American Medical Association, and the Surgeon General all recommend testing and lowering of value elevated indoor radon levels. The only way you're going to know whether or not you have a radon problem is you have to test. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, nothing like that. You need to test. And bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that, you know, testing is simple, testing is easy. You do not need to go out and spend $1,000 to test your home for radon. It could cost you anywhere between 10 and $30, and I'm giving you a ballpark figure here. But, you know, what are your chances of getting lung cancer? Well, number one, how much radon do you have in your home? How much have you, time you spent in your home? And let's be honest, for the last three years, we spent a lot of time, you know, in our homes here because of the pandemic, because of, you know, working from home. And even today, a lot of us, myself included, are also working from home quite more because this is now the new norm as far as that's concerned then. What I'm showing you right now, and this comes out of our what Citizens Guide to Radon and the Home Buyer and Seller's Guide to Radon, that if you have an average level of, let's say, four picocuries per liter, if you're a smoker, your lung cancer risk is like 62 per 1,000. If you're not, it comes down to seven. So that's, you know, you know, there is a major significance as far as that's concerned. So... How does, you know, how does radon get into your home here? And basically, it's usually through the movement of soil gas into the home that's predominant the area here. So what you see on this diagram is that if you have radium contaminated soil here, it will come up through any cracks and crevices from the slab or from the basement here and start making its way up to the first floor, to the second floor. Um, some homes that, you know, We've had a test where you had to put a detector in the basement because the basement is where the children played. That was like my townhouse back in New York. Or, you know, there was a large occupancy there. Or if not, if your house is like slab on grade, it's basically what kind of room are a lot of people, you know, hanging out in? Is it a den? Is it a living room? You know, we always tell homeowners to stay out of the kitchen, stay out of the bathroom, stay out of bedrooms here, because for bedrooms, people tend to close doors and such and don't have an open flow of air. For bathrooms and kitchens, some people have gone and purchased like granite uh, tabletops. Granite contains a uh, natural amount of radiation, depending upon where that granite is coming from. So we would like a, you know, a living area, a den where people tend to like congregate more. The other thing is that- I Ask a quick question that came into the chat here, just because it was relevant to the previous slide. Uh, but within okay. EPA region six, uh, where is radon mostly found geographically? Is there um, a, a specific geographic distribution that's relevant here? No, we that in the state of New Mexico, where you're going to find a lot of uranium rock because, you know, God put it there, you know, gazillions of years ago. I've been told by one or two people who work for the, you know, who work for the region, who are also really big into geology, basically telling me that no matter where you go in the state of New Mexico, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have a radon concentration here, you know, a good chance of a radon concentration. And once again, the only way to find out is basically by testing. Throughout other areas here, um, I'll be honest, like in Louisiana, you have what what's called a gumbo-y soil. It's kind of, I mean, like if you take a shovel and stick it into the soil, you're going to hit water, probably like halfway through the shovel blade here. Um, for people out in Louisiana, I tend to tell them to like, you know, if you want to test for a radon, sure, go right ahead. I also would look at other factors here like 
Are you accumulating mold in your house in areas you really don't look into? As far as everyone else here, it kind of like is hit and miss. Once again, it comes down to, you know, no matter where you live, test your home for radon. Can I get, uh, can I carry on? Yes, thank you. You got it. Um, Buildings create a vacuum that will draw in soil gases here, which you see up in this diagram here, and that it can be very small, and it kind of comes down to like your air pressure differentials here. Depending upon where you're living here, you may have, you know, a very small, or you may have a very high one here. It really all depends. And again, it comes back down to, you know, testing your home for radon. In this example here, this is just showing you kind of like, how radon can come in through your house. You could see it's coming in through floor drains and some it's coming in through joists, um, floor or wall joists, exposed soil or rock in a crawl space. I've heard many stories of where, you know, people will have a crawl space that it's nothing but sheer dirt. And it's like, okay, even though your basement is not being used, but you've got this crawl space, Let's put a detector somewhere in that basement near that crawl space and see what we're getting here. Okay. So basically, you know, you know, the bottom line as far as radon testing and what kind of like readings you're getting here, you know, if you have, and I'll go more into the, if you have an elevated level of radon, it's not like, well, you know, take good care and, you know, too bad, you know, you can take care of it, you know, Mitigation is available and it works, you know, and I'll go more into it then. Again, here's another photo to get to show what entry points you have as far as radon, you know, coming in through your house here, you know, and as it says, seen and unseen here. Uh, you can't predict radon levels based on your heating, your foundation, the age, the air tightness, the type of house. What do you have, a sump? a crack or other features you have to test. Doesn't even matter that your neighbor tested. If your neighbor tested, you know, if your neighbor tested on one side and got this number and then your other neighbor on your opposite side tested and got that number, you cannot say, well, hey, he got that, he got that, I got this, no problem. You need to test your home for radon. Uh, this is our 1992 radon zone map. We have three kind of like, you know, set colors here. You know, you have a red, orange, and yellow. And these are broken down into zones one, two, and three. The yellow ones are considered zone one. That's like less than four. Zone two is between four and eight. Zone three is, you know, is going to be from like eight and above. And you can see what kind of like levels and readings have you gotten here. Now, again, keep in mind, this map is like 30 odd years old. You know, a lot of states have taken a lot of their data information and have improved on it to kind of show how things are looking. To give an example, if you look all the way over and, you know, to see where El Paso is, you see that it's an orange color here. In some places here, there are areas that have gone to like a yellow, and there are some places here that have gone to red because people have tested, and that information has been uh, imported into um, one lab company that's located uh, in, in Carrollton, Texas, Alpha Energy, who's been a big supporter of the region as far as like getting test kits out to people and such that, you know, people have been improving on the map and doing a lot of good work on it here. But once again, I always tell people that they say, well, I looked on your map and yeah, it's 30 years old, but it looks like I'm all good. What do you think? And I tell them, no, you need to test your home for radon. These are our two big books here that we have put out you know, from day one and, you know, upgraded, uh, updated as time goes on. On the right side is the Citizen's Guide to Radon. That was last updated back in 2016. On the left is the Home Buyers and Sellers Guide to Radon, and that was updated back in March of 2018 here. We have gone out and spoken to real estate agents, and on, on different occasions, um, you know, 
either being at the grocery store or even at scout me, I'm not going to go into like my scouting and such and all that. I'll bore you to death. But, you know, just by meeting real estate agents and such and talking about radon and giving them an education because they're like, oh, this ain't an issue for radon out here. And it's like, no, you know, no matter where you live, you have radon. But these are our two guidelines. Our, you know, these books are available in a PDF form www.epa.gov forward slash radon. So, you know, we have that information available here and by all means, you could uh, definitely look at that then. Um, and basically all of our literature is provided via uh, PDF on our website here. As far as testing is concerned, basically when you get a test kit, you know, you know, you're going to have two types of test kit. One's called the short term, one's called the long term. Usually short term test kits are two to seven days. Long term can go anywhere from three months to a year. OK, you should go ahead and do a short term test, either two to seven days. And depending upon what that reading comes out, then there would be a determination of whether you should test longer or go straight to mitigation here. So it really, really all depends upon what does the short-term test here. We want you to close your house up. Now, the way in how you do that is that, you know, you close up your windows, you close up, you know, keep like outside doors closed. Now, for example, you know, in our home, majority of the time we go out through the garage, you know, um, you know, get in our cars and drive off. The front door is open for getting the paper in the morning and going out, you know, for the mail in the afternoon and, you know, trick or treat on Halloween. But this is a good time to test because, you know, here you are, you know, it's the winter months. I don't know about you, but we just got off some really good, you know, freezing temperatures and such that, you know, I'm in shorts until it's like really, really cold out and, you know, the long pants come out. You know, it's cold out. When George puts on his long pants, that's your clue right there. So you want to keep your house closed up here and such. And then you conduct your test either in your living room, your den, like I had mentioned before. You know, whatever the test kit tells you to do, if you put it out for two days, after you, you know, done your test for two days, you send, you know, wrap it up, mail it back to the company. Today, the company will have an email link that, you know, will give you your reading and, you can then go from there. Then, okay. Um, close your fire. Close your fireplace damper. You know, I'm pretty sure a lot of people had their fireplace in our house here. And after 25 years, we we never touched the fireplace here. <clears throat> and we, you know, again, you know, your detector goes into the lower level uh, area here. Um, you know, like I had mentioned before. Uh, depending upon, you know, what type of home you have, you know, if you do have a basement, you know, definitely you want to put one in the basement, put one on the first floor, possibly one on the second floor. But basically it comes down to like, you know, where you spend a lot of your time, you know, and where are you living here? Uh, to give an example, um, I tested, you know, our home back in New York and I've also tested, you know, our home in Texas. Our home in back in New York on a short-term test was less than one picocuri. On a long-term test for a whole 12 months was less than one picocuri here. Our home here in Texas, again, long-term test for 12 months here, less than one picocuri. And I'm I'm happy and pleased with that. You know, and so was the wife. You know, the boss is the boss is happy, life is good then. This gives you an example of where you should be placing your detector. Um, somebody came up with an ingenious method here of putting their detector in a small have a heart trap that you safely can trap like raccoons or mice or whatever kind of furry creatures you have out there. But they use their have a heart trap basically because they had a cat or no, they had a couple of cats and they didn't want the cats to play with the detector. And I thought, cool, because the have a heart trap is open. It's not closed in. And, you know, Kitty did not get to it then. So so this is how you basically should be placing um, 
your detector and such, um, and kind of keeping it away um, on like a stone surface, as you see, like a little like, uh, you know, dinner table and such. This over here is an example of what kind of detectors you have here. On the upper right-hand corner is where you have your typical what's called charcoal canisters. They're about the size of a hockey puck or a container for electrician's tape. That's the black tape and such. You may also have one that comes into like a foldable pouch here. On the bottom left is what's called an alpha track detector. Those are used to do anything. Those are your long-term detectors from three months on. There are other devices here called an EPERM and also a continuous monitor. But the ones that are used prevalently in the field are going to be your uh, charcoal canisters or your alpha track detectors here. Now, you get your results back. Uh, there is no safe level of radon, but four picocuries per liter is what we call an action level. And to give an example, I had a homeowner in and around the Dallas uh, area. Actually, he lived in Highland, uh, in Highland Park. And he did a two-day test, and he got a reading of two picocuries, and he wanted to mitigate. And I said, well, to be honest with you, I would recommend doing a longer study to see what kind of reading you have. And his reply was, I have the money and I want to mitigate. And I was like, okay, here are three names of companies that are in and around the Dallas Fort Worth area. You know, let me know if you need any help. And so that kind of advice, what I gave to him is what I would give to you or to anyone who called or emailed me. You know, I've had many occasions where when I worked for the county health department, and I would have, you know, someone call me up, you know, in tears because they got a reading of 4.1 and they could not afford to do any mitigation yet. What do I do? And I told them flat out, what we're going to do is we're going to take, you know, we're going to test for a little bit longer. We're going to see what we get and then go from there. And it turned out that they're, they went from a seven-day test of 4.1 to a three month test in the winter time and got like 1.2 and they were like happy and pleased with that and they felt comfortable enough to live with. I also recommend on that case there, okay, we got three months and we got a 1.2, let's go ahead and do a year long test. The year long test was less than one. The bottom line here, and I kept, you know, kept on saying here, you can't fix your house if you have a high reading, you can bring that down. We have under epa.gov forward slash radon, we have qualified contractors that are in and around the area. Now, let me be honest with you, depending upon where you are living, and I realize the people I'm talking to are around like El Paso, New Mexico area here. And if I'm incorrect, please shout out them. But, you know, the state of Texas does not have a lot of, you know, qualified contractors. You may be getting somebody that's coming out from Amarillo. You may find somebody that's coming from Dallas. If you're in El Paso, you have a bunch of people that are out in the New Mexico area. Mitigation is going to cost anywhere, and I'm going to give you a ballpark figure, between two to 5000 This does not include, like, you know, the amount that, you know, the contractor is going to charge you for the travel from point A to point B. If he has to stay overnight, that's going to be billed upon you. His meals are going to be billed upon you. So these are factors that need to be taken into consideration. And once again, going to our website, you will be able to find contractors that are, you know, in and around the area here. Um, mitigation depends upon the length of exposure, smoking status. Do you have children? You know, majority of the radon-induced lung cancers occur below the EPA action level. So basically, you know, depending upon, you know, genetics, some people could be getting, you know, you know, could be, you know, getting lung cancer, even if their readings are going to be below the EPA guidelines of four. So, you know, all of this needs to be taken into consideration.
Again, here is our consumer's guide for rate on reduction, you know, that we updated back in 2016. This is also available on our website here. We have a thing that's called active soil depressurization. And, you know, what you do is that if you look, if you look down at the bottom of right hand corner, you have the entry where you have a pipe that's drilled through the floor or the lowest living uh, level. Um, so that you've gotten into, you've gone past the slab and you've gotten to the soil concentration here. From there, you then have a monitor. You have what's called a YouTube manometer that's showing when the fan is drawing properly here. You go to number three and you have the pathway, which basically the pipe is going to be going, you know, from the basement into the first floor. And usually contractors will work this so that the piping is going into like a, uh, excuse me, a closet so that, you know, it's not standing out there and right in front of the living room. And then from there, it's going up into the base, uh, going up into the attic itself here. We're up in the attic. You're going to have an outlet that you're going to be turning on a radon fan. And that radon fan is blowing and taking up the, con you know, taking any radon concentrations blowing it out of the house, finally going up through the roof itself, you know, and the piping at, at the roof level is going to be above the roof line here so that it doesn't get sucked back down in here. Now, you know, again, like I said, this costs anywhere between two to 5,000 to get a ballpark number. The most important thing that needs to get done is that once this gets installed and is plugged in, it stays on forever and ever. You know, there have been incidences where people have gotten high radon readings and they bought into a house that had a radon uh, mitigation system. And when they found out they had a high readings here, somebody in their really right wisdom basically said, you have a radon mitigation system, correct? And they said, yes, we do. I said, is it on? Dead silence here. I'll call you right back. Five minutes later, Colo came back and said, thank you so much. The system was off. We turned it back on. We should have better results. Person then said, wait a day or two, do another reading and see what happens. Readings drop down. Having a system that I showed you here, to give an example, you could take a home that let's say had 25 Pico Curies with radon mitigation system working continuously radon readings drop down to one. You know, this is good. This is really good. The bottom line is that when you have a radon mitigation system, it has to stay on 24 seven, 365, or like this year, 366 days. You know, you don't shut off your refrigerator when you go to bed. So you don't do the same with your uh, mitigation system. Active soil depressurization is the most common approach, as you saw, and it basically, has a vacuum beneath the foundation, which is greater in strength than the vacuum applied to it here. You know, caulking and sealing may not do the trick here. Um, ventilation approaches have been more costly and less effective. In other words, people tell you can just open up your windows and such, and no, that ain't the way to go then and such. So basically what you're seeing right here in this photo is how mitigation systems are working here. On the left-hand side, you know, here's the piping coming through into the attic, plugged into an outlet that's already set over there. In the middle, you're just showing like how this is working both indoors and outdoors. Having an outdoor system is really good. However, when it's like, you know, it's like having an outdoor fan system is like having a heat pump. If you have your heat pump on the outside, when you get your cold temperatures, like we've had in the last couple of days, you got to check on this here to make sure that it's still working. Uh, this is that mammometer that I mentioned to you about. This go, you know, this gets placed inside near where the radon fan is located, and just making sure that it shows that it's working. And to give you an idea of like, you know, how good does it work here? Um, you know, here you see an example of where uh, the average radon level was basically about eight picocuries, 
after mitigation was installed here, dropped down to less than one. Mitigation does work. So basically the bottom line, as far as what can you do, you can always look at the document that came out of the Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors, reducing the risk from radon. The bottom line is you test your home for radon. You have no clue what you got unless you test, bottom line. And to end this presentation here, you know, this is what our, um, you know, our saying is for 2024, because January is National Radon Action Month, and you should test your nest for radon, fix your nest as necessary, save lives. That's where it all comes down to. Once again, um, this is me. Um, I give, you know, I would give you a phone number, but bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, I will respond to you a lot quicker via email than I would on a phone call. I mean, you know, call me silly or whatever you want, but I mean, there are occasions, you know, I will I will respond to somebody on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning if there's an email that pops up then. So again, you know, my email address, and if you need me to pop it in the chat, I'm more than happy to make that happen then. With that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stop sharing and I could, well, let's see. Uh, okay, let, I'm now looking at the chat. Um, okay, so I, I hit up on Steve and Wright. Uh, okay, there was a commercial from uh, Dr. Ma. Uh, okay, to somebody from Houston, go ahead and test, test your house uh, for radon. With regarding to Nebraska, um, what I would recommend is that if you need, I could give you a contact information for my partner up at uh, Kansas City, uh, that's EPA Region 7. Um, I was going to also entertain everybody over here since I mentioned uh, Region 7. I was going to put on my uh, chief's hat on. I've been known, and I'm not going to go into pictures at all, but I look quite like Andy Reid here, so I'm not going to go into that then. So so basically for the folks in um, for the folks in Omaha, um, by all means here, if you need a contact, and uh, yes, whoever Josie came on, you know, yes, um, KSU um, has been working with EPA headquarters um, with regard to, um, you know, handling radon, our 800 number and training. So, uh, <clears throat> If if the folks from Omaha need a contact information, shoot me an email and I'll make that happen then. Uh, let's see, are there any programs to help pay for mitigation? At the moment right now, no. Um, I'm not aware of any kind of like programs or grants uh, that are available. Um, let me back up. There is a possibility of any kind of grant work uh, that's coming out of the Biden administration through um, the IRA funding here, that there may be something in that. If, if you, if uh, Susan Buchanan uh, hit me up on that, I could uh, definitely, I could definitely help out on that. Are there any zoning rules and regs? At one time there was some around the Santa Fe, New Mexico area, but in other places here, the answer is no. But the bottom line here, and thank you, Dr. Monks, but the bottom line here is basically it's up to the homeowner. And yes, and thank you for putting my name and phone number up here. Any other, you know, anything else I could do for folks? Do you have information? Okay, hold on. Do you have information about radon sampled in water? Um, yes, we have done some testing of radon and water. Where I was up in, um, back in upstate New York, we had a lot, of, we had a geological formation known as the Redding Prong, uh, which comes out from Pennsylvania and came up into our county. 
Rockland County. And we had a lot of people who had well water that needed to test their wells and their wells had, you know, had high levels of radon. So what was installed or what people did was put in activated charcoal filters. The one issue we had after the activated charcoal filters um, was that, okay, now you got a radioactive filter. What do you do with it here? We did some work around and we did some research with EPA uh, in Region 2 in New York City and with headquarters to uh, to get around with that then. Um, and if you need additional information, I could definitely find that. And okay, thank you very much for, for that then. Uh, and with regarding to Patricia, I'm going to let uh, the good doctor answer that. Any other questions or comments or concerns? I mean, once again, ladies and gentlemen, you know, test your home for radon. You know, tell your neighbors, tell everybody, you know, go ahead and test. You know, especially like if you're in New Mexico, highly test. Um, just because of what I was told, you know, from a bunch of people who worked in our uh, uh, Superfund division who were geologists that no matter where you go in New Mexico, you're going to find uranium rock. <clears throat> So uh, just so everyone knows, I put a link in the chat. Uh, this link is uh, EPA uh, radon site, and it has um, radon zones and supplemental information. Um, so what's nice about it is it lists each state. Uh, it provides a, a website for their radon program, and then um, a state resource uh, with email and phone number, and then as well, it gives um, Mr. Borowski's information as a regional resource, but that is done for each state. So it can be very helpful for you if you're uh, looking into that. Also, um, we do have the CME, um, CNE link in the chat if you're wanting to receive credit for today. Um, actually, a question for me to uh, Dr. Monks, um, with regarding to the um, uh, the symposium in Houston, um, since I do a lot of indoor air, do you need me, you know, I hate to show folks, do you need me as any kind of presentation for anything on indoor air um, for schools, you know? Yeah, um, so we are currently uh, planning for breakout sessions. So I will definitely add you to that list and we'll we'll send you an email uh, about the specifics. Um, again, the the conference that is in going to be in Houston, the Children's Environmental Health Symposium in Houston will be held on May 8th and 9th. And then the Louisiana Children's Environmental Health Symposium will be held on April 11th and 12th. I was able to put the registration link in the chat for the Louisiana, um, for the Louisiana symposium. I will be sending an email to all our contacts regarding um, the save the dates for both activities, as well as the pills and thrills that kill conference. But if you would like to also email me and I can make sure that you are on our contact list and I'll add my email here as well. Okay, um, and again, I apologize to everyone and I didn't mean to like, you know, try to sell myself here, but I just want to let folks know, you know, um, and I have been reaching out to a lot of school districts here and doing tools for schools. Most importantly is like talking about like grant money that's coming available to a lot of uh, to schools and such. So definitely want to get the word out as far as that goes then. So again, let me, you know, give another shout out here to Dr. Um, Drs. Monk, Monks and Crawford for um, you know, helping me out, making me, you know, making me look good. I do appreciate that. Anything else from anybody out there? Well, everyone, thank you so much. Um, as a reminder, our next uh, Grand Rounds will be held on February 15th. 
and we will have Ms. Wanda Helgeson talking to us about pediatric injury prevention. Uh, you will, again, if you're one of our contacts, you'll be receiving um, that information via email very soon here. So, and if uh, you would like to be added, please, again, email me uh, and I'd be happy to send that off to you. And I just want to thank you so much, George, for being with us and for such a great presentation uh, and offering all of your help and, and mentoring in this area. <laughs> oh, you're quite welcome. You know, um, by all means, anyone need anything here? You have my name, you have my number, you have my email, you know, go right ahead. I'm here to help. Thank you all so much. If there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and end for today. Thank you.